mau kita mulai aja bu? Atau gimana? Boleh dokter. <laughs> Baik. Mungkin saya sementara ini pakai off cam dulu ya, Mitya. Siap dok. Uh, dear doctors and residents, uh, good evening. We will start our Indonesian Australian lectures online series uh, this evening uh, with the presenter by Dr. Yuri from University of Indonesia and also then Dr. Antonio Jubilato from Perth, West Australia. Uh, we will start uh, our session with Dr. Yuri presenting uh, her presentation. Please, Dr. Yuri, you can start your presentation. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity, moderator. I would like to present a case report entitled Trailer of Primary Glaucoma During Its Device Following Intraocular Procedure. What to do next? And the patient was female, 37 years old, with a history of cataract extraction of the right eye in seven years before admission and the cataract extraction of the left eye, suspicious of congenital cataract. At four year, in four years before admission. At six months before admission, uh, she felt part of vision of the right eye and the patient was diagnosed uh, with asthma and given um, and was given uh, medication with steroid and serotype. And uh, at six months before admission, the patients come to the ophthalmologist in other hospital and diagnosed with the high IOP on the right eye uh, and it was 38 millimeter hydrogerum. In the initial visit in our clinic, she uh, felt the blood vision of the right eye become um, worsened, and she uh, has uh, therapy three kind, uh, four kinds of uh, glaucoma medication, which are betaxolol, acetazolamide orally, tafopros, benzolamide, and the patient was advised to stop the steroid from the ophthalmologist in other hospital. And this is the ophthalmological status that uh, we found in the first uh, visit. Uh, the visual acuity of the right eye was 6 over 60, uh, with the best corrected visual acuity was 6 over 18. And the IOP uh, was 20, uh, 23.5 millimeter hydrogenum with a deep anterior chamber. And the cup disc ratio of the right eye was, uh, was 1.0. 1.0 with cupping bionic sign and nasalization. Uh, well, in the left eye visual output, it was 6 over 6. Uh, IOP was within uh, normal limit, and the cup and this ratio also within the normal limit. And we diagnosed this patient with secondary glaucoma of the right eye, suspicious for steroid induced glaucoma, and a differential diagnosis with pseudopathic glaucoma. So we continued the therapy from the, uh, the previous hospital and we plan to do the visual field test uh, with 24 to test pattern and follow up for the IOP after two weeks. And two weeks after the initial visit, we found the IOP uh, get higher, become 30 millimeter hydrogerum, and we continued the welcome medication and we plan to do Ahmed implant for the right eye. And three, uh, at three weeks after the initial visit, uh, it was the one day after the Ahmed implant surgery, we stopped uh, giving glaucoma medication, only giving antibiotic and also steroid topical. We found that uh, the IOP was uh, with a normal limit. It was a 10 millimeter hydrogen and the black was uh, formed. At uh, one month after the surgery, the blood becomes uh, broad and medium high. We uh, found the IOP uh, rise into 48 millimeter hydrogen. So we give uh, the glaucoma medication, which are bermonidine and combination of tafoprost and tamolo one times of the right eye. And uh, in the four months, uh, after an in initial visit or two months, uh, three months after the surgery, we've, uh, we kept the IOP under control with uh, our medication and we continued the medication with brimonidine and benzolamide. But the patient said that one month, uh, one month 
uh, later, one month before uh, this visit, the patient get TCP at other hospital. And the uh, five to nine months after the initial visit, the blood still high, and the patient still consume maternal cross, cardiolol, and grinzolamid. That the IOP is slightly uh, price uh, becomes 21 to 23 millimeter hydrogerum. So we plan to do blood aspiration and uh, five FU injection. On one day after the blood aspiration and five FU injection, the blood uh, was high, and the IOP um, of between uh, the IOP can uh, under control. It, if it was 19 millimeter hydrogerum, and we, and we continued the glaucoma medication before, and uh, and uh, three years and four months after initial visit, uh, we found that the IOP still under control, but uh, the lens position was uh, subluxated to the inferior part. The seed, uh, cup and disc ratio in this uh, in this uh, visit was uh, the same and uh, from the uh, previous visit. And so we consult to federal retina division to do undergo the first plan of hydrectomy and exchange DIOL. And three weeks after the surgery, the patient still consume full metal one uh, four times a day for the right eye. And we see the blood is uh, still high in this patient, but the IOP um, rising becomes 25.6 millimeter hydrogen. So we continue to give the medi uh, glaucoma medication and plan to do uh, IOP evaluation monthly. And fortunately, the IOP can be controlled at uh, four months after the surgery. But uh, at five months after the first plan of hydrectomy, the IOP start to rise again uh, in range between 22.4 millimeter hydrogerum to 26.8. The blab showed uh, it was low and um, the IOP of the left eye also rising become 25 to 48.3 uh, millimeter hydrogerum. So we diagnosed this patient with primary open angle glaucoma with differential diagnosis of steroid induced glaucoma. This is the uh, last follow up uh, in our clinic in the February 22nd, 2022. The visual acuity of the right eye was 6 over 7.5, and the left eye was 6 over 6, and the IOP um, still uncontrolled uh, both on both eye. In the right eye, uh, it was 22.4 millimeter hydrogerums, and in the left eye was 38.8 hydrogerum. Uh, the blab uh, was low on the right eye, and the anterior chamber of both eye was deep. Uh, the IOL was good in good position, but there are um, progressivity on the cup and this ratio on the right eye and the left eye. And this is the Humphrey visual fit test that performed by the patient in the uh, first third and fifth uh, visit. On the first visit, we can see the mean deviation of this patient was uh, 32.90 decibel. It shows that uh, this patient has a severe glaucoma uh, stage uh, on the right eye. And uh, we can see on the uh, third and fifth uh, visit, there are uh, uh, progressivity on the mean deviation it's, uh, it was about uh, minus two decibel per two year or about one uh, decibel every year. And we also performed the Gunglion cell analysis. Uh, we can see the average of the GCC or Gunglion cell complex. Uh, it seems uh, to be uh, stable from the first to uh, the, first to the um, fifth years. And this is the optic nerve head evaluation, OCT evaluation. We can see there uh, uh, there was uh, thinning on the superior and inferior um, RNFL thickness. And uh, in the fifth years, we can see there a progressivity on the inferior RNFL thickness. Uh, in this uh, in four to five o'clock uh, five o'clock part region, we can see from the uh, first. Uh, 
the first uh, mm -hmm. test, uh, the the thickness was still showed normal, and in the fifth year, there there was a progressivity on the thinning of the RNA RNA file. So in the last phase, we assessed this patient with PYG with difference diagnosis of steroid in this glaucoma of the right eye, was Ahmed implant, live aspiration F5 FU injection one times and micropulse one times. And also the ocular hypertension of left eye and pseudophagia of both eye. We continue to give uh, medication, glaucoma medication, which are trapopros, thymolol, primonidine, and prenzolamid and also astazolamide orally. And uh, we, we consider to do the further treatment uh, like second GDD implant of the right eye or second CPC capsule excision or blood aspiration or piggyback GDD. So uh, what to do when failure of the primary glaucoma remains in one surgery? Uh, this is a uh, one of the literature that I found from a few literature that evaluate the efficacy of second uh, of uh, food treatment after the failure of primary endurance implant. Uh, in this study uh, by Sever et al., which entitled failed glaucoma during its implant, long-term outcomes of a second glaucoma during its device for cyclophotoblation. It, uh, they evaluate the long-term efficacy between uh, second GDD versus CPC after the first uh, or primary drainage implant failure. And in, in this study showed that in the CPC group, uh, there are 30, about 34% of patients who need or require the uh, food treatment after the, within the, within the five years and 90, about 91% uh, from them need the food treatment within two years. And in the tube, uh, the second tube, uh, GDD or sequential tube uh, implant, we found there are about 60% of patients who need further treatment, but only 22% of patients who need the surgery uh, within two years. It is uh, much lower than the CPC group. And beside the, beside the IOP control or IOP outcome in this uh, study, uh, they also, uh, they also uh, measure the efficient outcome. And in, in these two groups, uh, it shows that in CPC, with, uh, in both CPC and tube implant, uh, treatment, we found there are about 20% uh, of eyes that have a worse vision in CPC and in two uh, group, we found there are higher, uh, higher patients who has worse vision. The definition of worse vision, uh, it means that uh, the patient that has two, at least two or more snellen lines uh, decline from uh, the first vision in uh, when the operative patient. Uh, and this is uh, the end this table outlines the result of IOP, visual acuity, and glaucoma medication that used between the CPC and sequential GDD groups. And the uh, IOP uh, and the IOP result, we can see that there was a significant uh, differences uh, between the preoperative and postoperative uh, IOP uh, in 12 months and also final follow-up in both groups. The IOP was uh, better in CPC and sequential GDD group. For the visual equity outcomes, uh, we found that only uh, in CPC group that shows significant result, uh, there was a worsened visual equity between preoperative and the final follow-up. And for the glaucoma drops, only in CPC group that uh, has a significant difference is uh, the number of glaucoma drops that use between perioperative uh, and 12 months and final, uh, final follow-up uh, medication. But in, uh, however, in the GDD group, only, uh, only difference uh, between the perioperative and 12 months, uh, num the numbers of glaucoma drops that uh, showed uh, lesser, lesser uh, 
number of locomotive has been used. This is the summary of the published result of many studies of sequential tube structural acidity and CTC after failure. And uh, we summarize there, uh, there are some studies who did the cyclophotocoagulation treatment after the first uh, failure, uh, the first initial, initial um, treatment with a drainage device uh, failure. There are three, uh, there are three studies who did the psychophotoagulation and the percentage of success in, in this group was with, uh, in range between 66.7% uh, to 88%. Uh, the, the success rate was higher than this study uh, because the, difference, uh, the differences on the operational definition and also in this study has a longer, uh, much longer uh, time follow up time. And uh, for the study that uh, perform additional implant, uh, there are seven studies uh, that showed uh, the variability of the success rate between 37% uh, to 86.4%. It can be uh, due to the it's much uh, higher than the study. The study only have 40% patient who has success rate. Uh, it can be due to the, it can be due to the longer time of follow-up that can be potential to uh, the GDD become, um, uh, the GDD become fail and cannot control the IOP. And the capsule excision uh, treatment that was done by uh, five uh, studies before, it shows the success rate vari variable between 25 to 75 percent. And this is the summary of the success rates of uh, three other treatments at uh, well, CPC additional implant and capsule excision with a uh, complication that can be happen uh, in each uh, treatment. So in conclusion, uh, although a greater success rate is predicted initially with the implantation of sequential GDD in the long term, there is continued attrition and a higher rate of failure. And in the CPC treatment, uh, CPC has a higher failure rate in the first two years, but for those who are successful at this point, most seems to then retain good IOP control in more uh, longer time. And for the capsule excision, um, treatment studies that reported that the rates of success were 25 to 75 percent, but uh, from those studies only involve very small numbers of patients, so it can be the limitation of this, uh, of this uh, study group. That's all, and thank you for the, your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Yuri, for the excellent presentation. Now I will give a time for Dr. Antonio Jubilato to present his presentation uh, please, Dr. Antonio. Thank you. Thanks for a uh, nice case. It sort of links in with my uh, talk. Hang on, let me get me on the screen. Is that, uh, is that on? Yes. Yes, Dr. Yep. Antonio. Okay. Now, um, I thought I'd go back a little bit because part of the problem with uh, the decision-making in failed glaucoma drainage devices is how you got there in the first place. Now, we all know that we've generally reserved GDDs for our complex glaucomas. And for those most of those cases, it's pretty much established um, that we go straight to a GDD in most cases. So phacic glaucoma, eye syndrome, epithelial limb growth, neovascularization, um, pa patients with significant conjunctival scarring and trauma, and patients that have had complex ocular procedures. So we sort of do that, but there are some caveats on that. Um, I have put this little slide up here just to mention, sorry, you can try and get this out of the way. Um, a new implant that you probably all now heard of, which is the Paul, uh, which you're probably going to see more of with the advantages of a smaller lumen and probably a better profile in terms of insertion. So that's only just been registered in Australia. I'm not sure if you have it available in Indonesia, but I think that may take over the implant scene. Why don't we move on? I'm also just going to 
pass back to this because like i said to you part of this talk is just going backwards a little bit to make sure that we don't jump into tubes too early and most of you remember this the uh, tvt study i've really only brought this up just to because uh, there's a little bit of a push and certainly out of even out of um new zealand with the maltino of looking towards gdd as a primary procedure or even after fairly minimal surgery and the uh the TVT suggested that in fact tubes may do better uh, in the long run. The trabeculectomy is out at five years, but that study had a lot of uh, issues with it. In particular, there was a bit of selection bias because as part of the study group, you already potentially had a failed trabeculectomy. So whilst the uh, cumulative probability of failure was in fact better in the tube group than the trabeculectomy group, I think it was very biased. So I really more put this up to just to remind people not always to believe everything you hear. I mean, sure, GDDs do well, and sometimes they do better if people, people haven't had prior, lots of prior surgery, but I'd be a little bit cautious. The other thing about this particular trial is I personally think the complication rate, particularly in trabeculectomy, was extremely high, and that obviously biases your decision in uh, how you make your side on surgery. The, the, the first question, therefore, is in before you get to the failed tube scenario, and maybe the case that was presented uh, is an example of this, is that just stop and think before you actually put a GTD in and, and look at what your other options are. We all know and, and that trabeculectomy generally gives us much lower pressures. Um, and if a trabeculectomy has worked well and given you many years and you have space, maybe not going to a, a, a tube at that stage and doing a redo trabeculectomy may be the right uh, uh, decision. The secondly, once you put a glaucoma drainage procedure in, the success rate of most other procedures is low. Now we've certainly played around with doing trabeculectomies or Zens. I'm about to put a couple of the uh, the, the uh, pressor flows in after a glaucoma drainage device, but generally they work for a short period and then they fail. So you almost back yourself into a corner. The other thing is the more operations you do on these eyes, the bit the worse they fare. So I'm seeing a lot of limbal stem cell deficiency and endothelial failure and CME and patients with this chronic fibrin leak. So again, always think not more, but more surgery is not always better. Um, in some eyes, you do have to accept that maybe you've done what you can and the end game is not necessarily an absolutely low pressure because you're still treating these patients and maybe even long-term Dimox at low dose if it's tolerated well maybe a better option than continuing with surgery. Um, also, just remember that there are some papers out there now, and I've certainly had some experience with this, that sometimes those conditions that we listed on the first slide um, for primary GDDs is not always the case. I've certainly had a couple of patients with ice syndrome where Zens worked well. Um, and in some cases, we actually do trabeculectomy and even a Zen in patients with neovascular glaucoma where we continue to maintain or turn off the uh, neovascular process with sequential anti-VGFs. Um, and in an eye where you really don't want to have another operation, maybe you shouldn't go straight to a GDD. Maybe you should just do go straight to a transcleral diode. So on the right-hand side, some pictures there of the sort of things that go wrong uh, when you have too many operations. So sick corneas, endothelial dysfunction, and CME. So in that whole journey from the point of view of where you end up with these devices, just remember that you've only got so much real estate in the eye and there are certain algorithms that you should probably follow so that you don't always end up getting stuck making difficult decisions. So I certainly keep the nasal quadrant now. I'm not sure whether Zen is taken off much in your part of the woods, but the nasal quadrant to me now belongs to the Zen, ab interno. It's not an area I generally use. The, uh, the section around the 12 o'clock is owned by the trabeculectomy, which I still think on an overall basis is the gold standard for pressure reduction. And generally I try and keep my GDD devices uh, temporal. You can put mix and match them a little bit, but that's sort of where you're sitting and you should always think about where you put your surgery so that you've got a back out plan if one of them fails. I'm gonna put this in again, just to say, well, hang on, if you're looking at an eye that's had a failed trabeculectomy before you jump straight to a tube, maybe look at some other options. And again, this is a Perth-based. Um, I looked at my own uh, series of uh, Zens that I've put in post-trabeculectomy. Um, we had about 12 in this series. And the take-home message is that it does extremely well. 
um, almost surprisingly better than I would expect. Uh, there's a couple of other papers around looking at the same thing in terms of uh, abinterno, uh, Zens after failed, as well as infranasal Zens. So my, my results in these 12 cases suggested about a 25% reduction in pressure, um, a reduction in medications, though all patients stayed on medications of some descriptions. There was a couple of complications like AC high femurs, which were all technical and not necessarily related to having a Zen as a primary procedure or a secondary one. But generally speaking, they worked. Um, they lasted on an average at this stage over two years and they gave a reasonable pressure reduction. So maybe again, before jumping in to a GDD, think of some other options that might uh, help you out in the short to, to medium term. I've thrown this in here as well, because maybe this also is something that could be used instead of a GDD as uh, after a failed trabeculectomy. I'm about to put a, a couple of these in soon um, and the reason why it may be a good option is the wound that you actually put it through is only one millimeter albeit it's generally thought to be put through a very large pyridomy but it basically means that if one of these fails you've still got some um, real estate where you can actually put a gdd right next to it uh, because you've still got enough space whereas another trabeculectomy used you very much limits your options so going back to really what we're meant to talk about, and that's uh, what do you do when you have a failed GDD and you really need lower pressure? We all know that the most common reason for failed um, GDDs is basically capsule fibrosis. And as your resident um, registrar pointed out, excision of the fibrous capsule is an option, but the success rate at two years is relatively low. This is just a ballpark average, but it fits pretty much with the numbers that you saw. I've heard of people also needling with antimitotics in the early phase. I personally haven't had that experience. And for not, I'm not quite sure why, but I don't seem to have that many patients that have aggressive early hypertensive phases that are very prolonged. It could be the nature of our population in terms of the, con the Caucasian conjunctiva, um, but I certainly haven't had to manage that in a uh, serious way in many cases. Um, if you talk generally at glaucoma meetings, the people that do this, they've sort of got no other option in terms of uh, pressure management. And in fact, uh, most people accept that it's only a short-term solution. You're then basically looking at either a diode laser, either admitted by a transscleral or endodiode or even micropulse I've tried, or you look at a secondary GDD device, either a second tube insertion as a separate procedure or a piggyback uh, um, GDD. They've probably got similar success rates, but different advantages. So when you're looking at an eye to try and therefore decide what your best options are, remember that most of these cases, you're not looking for massive reductions in pressure and you're not gonna get them either. Most of the papers do only get pressures down around the 18 or so millimeter mark at best in most cases. What you really should look at then in terms of making your decision is very much a, um, a detailed anatomical assessment you want to look at where the anterior, what the anterior chamber depth is in the presence of PAS. Ultimately, any tube that you put in is going to affect the cornea, and the distance from the tube to the cornea has been known, has been shown to be extremely important. So always look for options if you're putting a second GD or putting it into the sulcus or the pars plana. You definitely need to assess endothelial function and warn the patient of the high likelihood. Um, and it may be quite delayed in 10 to 20 years time of uh, endothelial cell dysfunction. You wanna know if the eye is prone to uveitis and CME as certain interventions are likely to increase this uh, more commonly. You really need to poke around the conjunctiva. You've got to assess what your real estate is and where you can put things. Um, you've got to decide before you go into theater whether the conjunctival is mobile enough the presence of diplopia is important because, again, you don't want to be putting extra GDD devices where this is already present. The target IOP, as indicated, whether the patient's got other ocular mobilities like a, a, carot a penetrating keratoplasty or a DSEC. Um, and the other question that's really important, I think, in the survival rate of any second GDD, whether it's piggyback or um, a de novo one, is the success rate of the first tube. In our experience, if the first tube failed, often the second one will do likewise. So looking at the, the piggyback GDDs, and this is a paper that was actually published by one of our fellows with, along with uh, Dr. Morgan, um, where basically we've essentially plugged um, uh, 
a second GDD into the capsule of the first. So the little schema on the right here, I don't know if my mouse shows up, showing a perimeter, perimeter here, which has isolated the conjunctiva adjacent to the primary tube and exposure of the superior rectus. Um, we basically then um, hook the superior rectus, attach a GDD device. Nowadays, we tend to use a truncated bar belt because we can easily slice off one of the wings and it's a fairly nice profile. You effectively pass the tube, which is tied off under the muscle and then insert it into the capsule of the tube, uh, of the primary tube. We put that bevel down and we make a small incision underneath just to ensure that the actual ostium doesn't get occluded. When you're doing this, you do end up leaving a, a hole in the capsule. And so generally we feel leave the eyes full of viscoelastic uh, and be prepared to re-inflate the eye if required after two to three days is generally the uh, viscoelastic hydrolyzers. And you can get a significant amount of peritube leak from the insertion point because the capsule is fibrous and it's not a tight insertion. In, that, in the series that we've published here, there were 17 eyes of the mean follow-up for about six years. And as you can see what I was saying before, the sort of pressures you're going to get are not sort of uh, amazingly low, but they're better than where you started. So a mean pre-IOP of 27 down to 18. And at last follow-up, which is at about six years, about a 40% success. And this is a fairly common number down the track with a bit of an earlier success rate uh, in the first year or two. A lot of these eyes did end up requiring further surgery. Generally speaking, if they lasted the two years, they will continue to last. And I'll show that on a survival curve later. Complications on these complex eyes are often common. Uh, there were certainly some wound issues. And I went off piggybacks a little bit because I had a lot of problems with conjunctival dehiscence. These eyes have had lots of operations. And so you've got to be very careful with the uh, management of the conjunctiva and its nascent position. There has been some cases of tube retraction and complications post-operatively in terms of the low IOP because of the way you insert the tube have to be managed aggressively, or these end eyes end up with lots of corneal problems and uveitis problems. There was a significant number of eyes that lost vision, and that was all most of the time for multiple reasons, some of which was glaucoma and pressure management. These are the survival curves in terms of uh, time, and you can see on the first graph. There was, a, there was a gradual reduction in the survival rate out to about two years. And then if it basically worked, there was a reasonable success out to six. Vision fluctuated, some eyes got better, some got worse, and some stayed the same. And uh, the mean IPs, you can see it again. There's a couple that sort of dropped and went into a hypertensive phase, a um, bit of a scatter, but overall a general reduction. So this is just a little video to show the technique. So this is a Maltino 3 being put in. So the conjunctival perimeter here, that's the previous tube in the eye. The, the Maltino 3 is quite a rigid plate. I prefer the bar belt as it's a softer plate and I can cut the, 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 uh, the um, one of the wings, insert it, attach it to the eye, and then sneak the, uh, a tied off first with a 50 vicral. 50 vicral is always going to give you about a seven week. I think that's the ideal. There's some people that tie tubes off with ATO, but they will often drain at four weeks, which in most in a lot of eyes is insufficient time for fi adequate fibrous encapsulation. We make a little nick in the capsule. Like I said, that's very hard to seal that. <clears throat> I do try and pull tenons around it if possible, but it's not uncommon to get a significant peritube leak requiring additional viscoelastic. And if the, the one warning I would tell you is to watch these eyes closely for the first three to four days. Uh, the day one IOP is important. If you have viscoelastic in the eye and you have a pressure of 20, you can relax. If it's under 10, be prepared to pump the eye up again the next day. You really do not want these eyes to shallow out or you'll do more harm to their cornea in the short term than you will in the, in saving them in the long term. So, if you're going to put a second GDD device in, as, in an eye, and that's generally been my preference over time rather than the, 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 the piggyback, um, you do need to look at uh, the uh, issues with the cornea. Um, there's a lot of papers out there. This is one of the larger series published in Graphase. Um, these are 49 eyes with a pressure, mean IOP at start of 23. 
reasonably good pressure reduction. And I find I get better pressure reduction this than with the, the uh, piggyback tube. Um, most again remain on medication, but there's a reduction. And again, if you sort of put medication in, the success rate, but with fairly modest uh, targets of 18 and 21 is around about the 85% mark, even out to three years. And if they work well, again, they tend to hang around for the five or six year mark, but don't be prepared to accept that it's going to work uh, forever. Any other options that you can look at then if you are really in that situation where you do not want to put another glaucoma drainage device for whatever reason, either there's no real estate to play with, the cornea is also already decompensated um, and you basically just deny that you just don't want to have more surgery on. Now, this, these uh, endoscopic cytophotocoagulation, which I'm not sure if you have available, is a very neat little technique. So you use a nice probe, which uh, is a bit expensive because the probe in theory is only is meant to be single use. So it can be an expensive procedure and you look for photocoagulation of the anterior um, ciliary processes. The better way of delivering it is actually by the past plan if you have a retinal surgeon that's prepared to do it because the efficacy rate is much higher. Um, I've done quite a few of these, and this is one of the larger papers from Murakami who gets some excellent results out at two years with you know, almost a 70% 70 70 reduction in pressure, which is much better than the GDD um, uh, success rates. Uh, and if you look at the survival curls, curves again, you can see this acute drop in success rate. And then basically they, they work, they work with the ECP doing better than the GDD. But in my hands, I've actually found it very technically challenging to get them to work. It's not technically challenging to do, but I'm fine they're unpredictable. And, and, uh, and they often end up, uh, the pressure slowly creep up over the first one to two years. The other problem is that you've often got an eye that's fairly complicated and it's uh, not uncommon to end up having to deal with vitreous during the procedure and, and intraocular lenses that are unstable. So I've backed off this a fair bit um, and really only now use it when these eyes, which have already had a glaucoma drainage device, have a cataract that's uh, removed afterwards and therefore I'll combine it with an endodiode and that's about the only time I'm using this procedure. The other option, which I think is a very good one, but has its own complications, is transcleral diet. And the resident pre presented some lovely papers. This is the, the, the paper that was presented. So I won't go into details. But effectively, the take-home message for transcleral diet versus GDD is that there is a lower success rate initially. Um, and you've also got to accept that there's likely to require additional treatments. Um, and that secondary GDDs, if they work out to two years, will generally do better. So you've got to decide which sort of scenario you have. Do you need an acute pressure reduction uh, and not prepared to retreat or whether you want to have a GD, second GDD, which is more likely to work in the long term? Um, I tend to make the decision based on the type of eye rather than the success rate. So often the visual potential of the eye other issues involved in terms of the cornea, for example, uh, the ability of the patient to have a general anesthetic or, or a long local anesthetic and make the decision then. There's one big paper that's going to be published at some stage, which is the ASSIST, which is actually a better controlled trial, uh, a well-controlled trial looking at uh, GDD versus transcleral diet. Hopefully we'll get some information with an end date there in 2023. So in uh, summary, uh, firstly, always consider non-GDD options prior to the insertion. I think that's going to get you out of trouble a lot of the time. A very good surgical uh, assessment prior, looking at the conjunctiva, the anterior chamber depth and the sulcus availability, endothelial function and other comorbidities. I've sort of put this in a little bit of an order as to generally what I do, and I'm generally tossing up, therefore, between the transcleral diode and the second GDD in the eye. The uh, transcleral diodes, I think, often get you out of trouble. It's a relatively straightforward procedure, um, but I tend to avoid them in near vascularization and uveitis. I think almost all eyes that you laser transclear with NVG eventually will become hypotenuse, uh, and that's been my experience, and it sort of makes sense. You're dealing with a compromised vasculature. They're probably my uh, position of uh, procedure of choice in eyes with already a compromised cornea, 
if a patient's uh, already got a history of CME or they're prone to it, a transcleral dye will give them CME and you're going to have to manage that. Hopefully that'll be a short-term problem, but sometimes it requires ongoing treatment of the CME. I think you almost universally see CME transiently proscleral diet in my hands. I tend to do a limited treatment and prepare to repeat. So generally, if they've got a GDD plate placed already, I'll only do a 180 treatment and I'm prepared to repeat it later because once you do too much, it's uh, can't you can't go back. If you then opt for the best IOP reduction long-term, and I suppose that's probably the best summary, I would go for a second GDD. And in my hands, I tend to prefer one in a, as a second procedure. But if you're good at the piggybacks, I think they can get you out of trouble and... and, and uh, look after the cornea a little bit better. You've got to make sure you've got adequate conjunctiva, a nice deep AC or the sulk is available and put the tube, leave it short. I see a lot of tubes that are put in that are too long. They don't need to be that long. Uh, ACV Maltina used to measure them just at the limbus and so they were quite short. Be a little careful leaving them too short because if your pressures fluctuate too much and the IOP in the eye goes up, the short tube can actually be pulled out of the eye and then it will occlude suddenly. I try and avoid a second glaucoma drain device in the anterior chamber if you've already got corneal decompensation or, and obviously try and avoid these devices in people already with diplopia. And as previously said, a previous GDD success rate tends to correlate with how well these devices work in the second instance. I always supplement these pretty much with mitomycin C um, and my standards 0.3 for three minutes, but possibly you could do, use more. Bill Morgan published a paper years ago suggesting that, that the major benefit of the mitomycin was in fact reducing the hypertensive phase. There may be more to that though, in terms of IOP lowering. The piggyback again, be prepared to do it in the setting where the conduct, the cornea is already compromised. Uh, always be careful with your conjunctival integrity because even in Bill Morgan's series, there were some cases of uh, conjunctival breakdown and, uh, and exposure of the tube. And I certainly have had to deal with that on a number of occasions. The same applies if the previous GDD worked, the second one is likely to. I again would supplement with mitomycin. The endocyclophotocoagulation I find is non-sustaining and unpredictable and therefore I've really switched away from it. Plus there's a cost. Um, and vitreous complications and unstable IOLs make it quite an uncomfortable procedure to deal with surgically. And I've had to send a couple of patients off for vitrectomies after an endo-CP, which is it's sort of a fairly big thing when you think an endo-CP is meant to be fairly straightforward. And like I said, the only real time that I'm using this uh, technique now is when I do a cataract in, a tube, in an eye that's already got a tube and I want to lower pressure. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anthony. Uh, now we'll proceed with the discussion. Uh, there are already two, two questions for Dr. Antonio. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is from Dr. Vidya. Uh, what is your strategy in maintaining patients on long-term diamox? Do you adjust dosing or do renal function testing regularly? How long can you keep patients on diamox? Thank you. Okay, so firstly, I think the dose is important. Very few patients will tolerate more than one to two Dimox a day. Some of these eyes are very sensitive to aquasin, uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So in fact, sometimes that is enough of a dose. I wouldn't keep people on anything more than two a day. Um, in terms of renal function, I find that it's not, I think the body adapts to these things. And so, yes, I'll certainly test them or get the general practitioner to, to test them early. Um, but once you've established on them, probably no more commonly than every six months uh, for U and E's, uh, I don't tend to test for anything else. The rare causes of blood dyscrasia, if they happen, they happen. You're probably not going to pick them up by routine um, screening. Um, what was the second part, the third part of the question? Uh, testing regularly and how long? How long can you oh, keep? Look, I, I, I've kept people on it for years. Um, oh, if you have an eye that basically you got to, sometimes you've got to be a little careful. You, 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 there's a point in an eye's life cycle where more surgery is not better for it. I mean, my comment on that case that was presented was I think we've missed the boat. Um, that patient had very little field. The likelihood of that eye surviving for many more years is probably fairly low. Um, admittedly, their pressure was very high. 
But I think at some point you've got to look at an eye and go, how much more can I do? You have treated it. You've reduced their pressure. But a lie lying around with a pressure, say, at high teens or low 20s, but it's come down from a pressure of 40 and you're avoiding other surgery and you've almost got no field left and you may already have a compromised cornea, maybe the better option is just keeping people on Dymox. But I've kept them on it for years, um, haven't had a problem. One to two tablets a day is, is, is acceptable. And don't forget, years ago, people would have taken those they had very few other medications. A so long-term Dymox, um, whilst it not, may not be perfect, um, is probably quite safe, unless you get unlucky and get a blood dyscrasia, but probably the worst thing that can happen to you is you get kidney stones. Yeah. I have one, Dr. Antonio, with patient with blood dyscrasia. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Every, every medication is going to have something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then there is, uh, there, there is another question, Dr. Antonio, from Dr. Mita. Uh, the question is how early would you normally consider to do needling with antifibrotic agent after the GDD procedure with hypertensive phase? Yeah, you're probably asking the wrong person. I don't know why, but I have very, very few patients that have had a prolonged hypertensive phase. Um, I do occasionally use a bit of a modification of Maltino's cocktail. So he used to use, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, one of the drugs I can't remember, but steroids and anti-inflammatories and a bit of a funny dose, but I've certainly put patients on oral anti-inflammatories, even occasionally low-dose steroid, because um, there was some evidence that what he used to propose actually worked. Um, but no, I, you're probably asking the wrong person. I very rarely have had to um, worry about the hypertensive phase. I'm more inclined in my hands to go forward and do a limited transcleral diode. So 180 degrees to get them out of trouble, knowing that it, it'll work for a short period and then drift back in. Um, I think you, you from Indonesia, I think you guys have done more of that than we have. I'm not sure that Bill either does many uh, five if you needlings of um, glaucoma drainage device blebs. Yeah, we have uh, quite a lot uh, numbers of patients with the hypertensive face. Uh, which post. which tube are you using? Um, I, I, now I mostly use my uh, the VGI that we have and yeah. also the Ahmed also. Uh, but um, then in some patient we could control the IOP with the with the medications. Yeah. But yeah, but one or two we have to do the like mm. also the anti fibrotic agent yeah. subconjunctively. Yeah, I wonder if it's the type of chew because my experience early on with Maltino, initial Maltino and even the Maltino 3 was you get a much more higher insisted bleb certainly on a Maltino 3 than you do on a Barvelt. Um, so maybe it's the profile of the bleb. Um, the other big issue with GDD devices and insistment is the presence of aqueous. It's a bit like trabeculectomy. If you the mechanisms around the healing are very similar. They just sort of a different time frame, and one you've got a plastic reservoir and one you don't. But insistment is is caused by one hypotony to start with. That's number one. So that's never good for an eye because it initiates all the fibrotic processes because that's the way you get out of trouble. Um, and secondly, a certain amount of aqueous is probably good for bleb maturation. So ideally and i'm not sure how you guys are putting the tubes in, and i've gone away from having tubes drain too much to start with because of the complication rates but the a perfect amount of aqueous perking around your bleb early on is probably very good for bleb maturation and avoiding insistment um and so you know the original maltinos came out with that little shelf to try and maintain a little bit of fluid around the plates and then uh, ultimately even Maltino himself realized that low pressure wasn't a good idea so a small amount of percolation of fluid through a slit or drain is probably good for a bleb um, so I see a few more nowadays I tend to put a lot of GDD devices in and I just tie them off I may not actually put a slit in them at all so or, or no have, have no rip cord because basically for a lot of eyes that we're we're not talking about these very high pressure eyes these are eyes say with a pressure of 20 to 25 where they really do need another procedure and you've opted for a GDD because everything else hasn't worked. But those eyes are, you know, they've got reasonable pressures on medications. So in fact, I tend not to get them to drain. I plumb them in and they just go back on their drops. 
But in that scenario, I'd probably see a little bit more of a hypertensive phase. Um, and I'm probably using a bit more mitomycin over my plates, uh, which according to Bill's paper, uh, minimizes that. I don't know if that helps you your thought process, but maybe, yeah, look at other tubes. Maybe a barvelt doesn't insist as much, but don't quote me on that. And that's just been my clinical observation. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. Uh, there is another question from Dr. Laura, uh, Dr. Agnes. When you do second GDD with mitomycin C, yep. when do you put the mitomycin C? And how I put it about the dosing. I, I do look, I don't use as much mitomycin C probably as elsewhere. Um, I, I think it's the dosing is related to technique and there's all sorts of, so just putting high doses of mitomycin isn't the answer. Um, and who knows how much we put in as well. I suspect after a minute or two, you've probably got a fairly good dose and you can leave it there for longer. And then maybe there's a tip point where you're creating more problems. But basically, I, I do my contractile primity. I sling my muscles still. I've tried without slinging, but I find it actually slows me down. And then I put the mitomycin back past the muscle insertion where the plate's going to be. And I do three minutes of 0.3, um, but you could do it different combinations. So I do it prior to attaching the tube. Uh, so it's pretty much like I do with a trabeculectomy. So it is in, in the plate area? Yes, yes, in the plate area. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so quite posterior. So always use bigger sponges okay. um, and count them. <laughs> the one time you can lose them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there, there's another question from Dr. Mefina Aulia, uh, Dr. Anthony. Mm, in which cases do we need to do second GDD other than the other procedure after a failed first GDD? So for you, the second GDD that you choose the, the case. What well, case? I mean, to, to summarize that, not that often. So, in 20 years, and I would have put in 50 glaucoma drainage devices a, a year at least, which is a lot for Australia. Um, I would still have only put in maybe 20 second GDDs. Um, so I've generally put them in where pressures are significantly elevated. So we're talking, you know, pushing around the 30 mark or 25, 30 plus. I won't, I won't put another device in if I've got running pressures of 20, even if the glaucoma is bad, because this is my theory that you're probably going to do more harm than good in those eyes um, because you try and find another option. But uh, yeah, like I said, out of 20 years of 50 a year, at least, only a dozen or so, or maybe 20 maximum. So it's a select group of patients, patients who've still got, uh, you know, got a significant glaucoma, reasonable corneal function. I have room to put a GDD in. Um, I've just done the bilateral double GDDs on a young chap in his 40s with uveitis, whose first tubes Bill put in and lasted close to 10 years. Uh, he was uveitic, so I wasn't keen on um a diode um his corneal function not perfect he's probably going to end up with corneal decompensation so i figured if i can get them nice and short well away from the cornea which i have uh, i'm probably not going to accelerate his corneal dysfunction by that much and he's probably going to have to have a graft at some point anyways and discuss that with him um so yeah they're the sort of eyes so bad glaucomas reasonable space um, and reasonable conjunctiva. I mean, if you've had an eye that's had a buckle and the conjunctiva is already stuck and you've really struggled to get your first tube in, um, you're really not going to go and put in a, a glaucoma, another device. You're just asking for trouble. Um, that's been my experience. I've had a couple where I've had to remove the second GDD in that setting. So yeah, the, it's the conjunctiva and the space you have in the, on the surface of the eye that's probably the crux. And just avoid it in eyes which have already got poor corneas or, or the anatomy such that you just cannot put the tube away from the cornea. I'm not a great fan of pars plana uh, in terms of if they've had a vit complete vitrectomy and, for example, an aphakic glaucoma, yes. I wouldn't think twice about putting a second pars plana in. I have done that a few times. Um, but a lot of those eyes get complications in terms of CME and other things. So it's not a completely benign procedure.
There's that sort of answer. I know that's vague, but probably these eyes are quite selective. Um, and, you know, more often than not, you can find some other option. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. So maybe... I, I probably head more towards a transscleral diode nowadays than I would a second GDD. Do you considering also the visual acuity in those cases? Yeah. So, you know, visual function, I think sometimes we base the number and forget what the eye is like. And I think the first, the case that was presented, now you've done everything you've done, it would be a good example of where do you draw the line um, in terms of aggressive surgery because that, that patient has very little function left. Anything you do is likely to compromise their vision uh, more so than the opera and then the actual pressure is. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. Uh, there is the, the last question, Dr. Anthony, from oh no, there is there is still two questions. Is it okay with you? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> okay. From Dr. Anissa. Um, she asks, uh, when you said avoid early hypotony, what's your target um IOP on first days or first week? And when well, no, so it depends on the eye. So most of the time I now put a GDD, there's a primary GDD, I put it in without viscoelastic. I just pump the eye up with BSS and I insert it. In an eye that's got PAS or I'm going to put the lamp, put it in the sulcus, yes, I'll put viscoelastic. So just remember that once, and I don't slit tubes. I don't, do you guys slit most of your tubes? Do you put a Sherwood slit in or, or do you use no, a ripcord no. system? I, I, or? I make a, like a slit, slit, a slight flow. Slide flow. Yeah. Okay, so firstly, if you don't need to put a slit, don't. <laughs> that creates all your problems. So if this eye has been running around, with a pressure of 22 or 25 for the last three months, the pressure takes more and doesn't have to be 10. Okay, okay, it doesn't have to be 10. It can be 22 again, you can put the patient on drops because all your complications in the first phase, the first week or two from tubes is generally from hypotony. And hypotony is more dangerous to the eye than a pressure of 22 for another seven weeks. So first of all, think twice before you put a slit in. I'm doing a lot of um, eyes where I do a stab with a needle, either a 30 or even a 25 gauge, and you can do multiple stabs in the tube. It won't be miraculous, but it'll often just take the edge off the pressure enough so that you're not in trouble. But if a patient's medically controlled, don't be scared to leave them medically controlled until the tube kicks in, okay? Once you put this plastic in the eye, you've got to remember that. And the biggest problem I have in our public systems is that the registrars don't understand that we put viscoelastic. So once you put viscoelastic in an eye that has a, a slit or any sort of drainage process, most viscoelastic that we use, so Helion, Provis, will basically hydrolyze over about two days. Mm. Um, and so day one, if you've left viscoelastic in an eye, you want a pressure of about 20. Okay. And day two, most of the viscoelastic in most eyes is gone. So your day two pressure will be your critical pressure. Oh, I see. Um, so if you're if you don't see them on day two, you will won't pick that. So they'll drop and they'll come in on day four with choroidals and a shallow AC and all the other problems. So as soon as you put viscoelastic in, you're gonna to have to watch them move more closely. If you haven't put viscoelastic in, then your day one pressure can be anything above 10 is fine or even eight or nine. Um, but if you've got a low pressure in a tube, don't sit on it. If it's early and it's low and it's shallowing out of the you probably have to go back and retie your tube. If you've left viscoelastic, you make that decision after about two days. If you've got a situation where you have the slit and your conjunctiva is intact, generally recurrent viscoelastic injections will help and will solve your problem. But if you've got a wound leak and you've got over drainage, be prepared to book the theatre list again two days later. The other critical part about tubes, which I can't um, emphasise, the, again, the hypotony bit is the seven-week phase. So do you tie with a 5-0, 6-0 or an 8-0? 6-0. Usually we have 6-0. Yeah, a 6 and a 5, in my experience, are about the same. Oh, okay. Um, my experience is with a bar valve, a six is a because it's an ex, almost an exponential to do with the tube with the radius, it's a much finer suture. So mm -hmm. I had a few fellows that managed to truncate my tubes with a six <laughs> um, because it is quite a lot finer than a five. So I still tie with a five. Oh, you I find 
Yeah, I find between a five and a six, the time frame for it opening up is about the same. It's about seven weeks. Okay. You can almost click, put your clock on it. I can put, you can put your diary on it and it'll be seven. Every now and then in a uveitic or a young patient, it'll drain earlier. So that period is when these eyes get into trouble again. And particularly on eyes where, for example, that you know your slits only work for three, four weeks and they're back on all their drops and diamox. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is preempt that closure, that opening. So you always see the patient the week before and you tell them if they're on diamox, diamox will take about 48 hours to wear off. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I operate on a Thursday. And therefore, at seven weeks, I see them close to that seven-week mark, and I'll tell them two days before they stop their thymox, and one day before they stop all their pressure medications. Okay. And since I've been doing that, and then I see them the day after the seven weeks, and since ever since I've done that, I can't remember the last severe hypotony that I've had with a GDD that opens up. Because you just stop it. What you want to do is, as soon as it opens, their ciliary body kicks in and picks their pressure up. It'll dip. Most people will describe it as a bit of a funny change. Yeah. Uh, and it's almost always at seven weeks. Every now and then a little bit more, every now and then a little bit under. But that's with a five or a six O. If you're using a, a seven or an eight, it'll dissolve too early. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Anthony, actually, Dr. Anissa uh, have another question. Yeah. Uh, in the non-valve GDD, do you prefer no flow suture on the tube? No flow or like? I go no flow. We we used to put a rip cord on the outside, and I've done rip cords on the inside. Mm. I, I just do a non-flow suture. Yeah, I think one of uh, Ruju Meter had been trying to play around with uh, the flow suture. Yeah. We can't seem to work out what happens. <laughs> okay. to try and predict it um i just think you know i like get to go skiing on weekends so i don't like hypotony and like i said to you i don't think these eyes if the, if you've got an eye that's got a pressure of 40 and i did two tubes yesterday on pressures of 45 and so i've had to put a slit in them the slits is so unpredictable and i've done hundreds of tubes thousands but i still can get the, the amount wrong um, because it's all also to do with the ocular elasticity and how much room, and if you've got a hyperopic eye or a myopic eye. And both of those I, I saw today because I left a bit of viscoelastic in, and both of them I'm worried about seeing them tomorrow because they were both 10 today with viscoelastic, so they're going to drop. Um, so I personally, when I get it, in terms of the reason I therefore tie my tube off is that you've got three places the tube can leak. So one on your tube insertion. Mm -hmm. I use a 25 gauge needle which for a bar valve, which is actually quite a difficult insertion to do. It's tight, but it yeah. won't leak. Yeah. I used to do a 23, but you get peritube leak. Yes. Then you've got the slit. And then on top of that, if you leave the suture slightly loose, then presumably you may not put a slit in, you've got potentially two to three areas that you're trying to juggle to try and get your flow correct. You might be smarter than me, but I can't work that out. <laughs> So I tend to say, okay, well, I'm going to tie it off. I have a tight insertion. And so the only place it's going to drain is from my slit. Therefore, I've only got to potentially worry about one, one flow, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. okay. uh, the last question from Dr. Andy Marsa, Dr. Anthony. Um, how long should we wait after glaucoma surgery, such as trabeculectomy, to start considering for GDD? And what are the important considerations? So oh, you can do one straight away. Um, mm. I mean, the, ma the major issue is the wound. Mm. So, I mean, I've had, uh, we've gone in, and it's not so much the sclera, it's more the conjunctiva. So I've had one just recently where I went to do a trab and the conjunctiva was in such a poor state. It was actually post-zen and we're having some issues with post-zen with mitomycin C subconjunctivally causing scarring. Oh, I see. Yeah, so I went in to put a, a trab in and basically I could not get a conj that was going to be watertight. So I did a GDD, I think, at four weeks, but I probably could have done it at two. But it all depends on the, the conjunctival surface. Oh, so yeah. As long as you can then maintain a watertight closure, you could in theory do one the next day if you had to, or you know, a week later. Obviously, the longer the better for the, but, but within about, well, certainly by four weeks, you've got enough healing that that's fine. But even by two, I reckon you may get, depends on what incision you've made. 
Mm. But I don't think it affects. It's more the conjunctiva and creating the watertight closure rather than the success rate of the um of the tube. It's about the conjunctiva. Okay. Presumably in that setting, you've got a very high pressure. Therefore, you're going to have to go in sooner rather than later. And obviously pick where you... That's a bit of a bit, little bit like what I said about the real estate management. So my trabs are generally done at 12 o'clock to slightly nasal now. Um, oh. And I encourage temporal flow. So I do three releasables, so I get them to flow temporally. My nasal stitch rarely comes out. Mm. And then I, I've got room for a zen if I needed it. Okay. Um, if you had a trab that was failed, I'm not sure if you've got zens in that setting and the conjunctiva was reasonable, you, you may opt to do something semi-permanent like a quick zen to control the pressure mm. whilst the, if your conjunctiva was watertight enough yes. and then let the tube, you know, put the tube in later. Because the problem you have, you've got a high pressure scenario, you need conjunctival closure if you're going to have a slip for it to drain. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we have a uh, yeah. Our patient, our glaucoma patient, usually have a very high IOP. You know, yeah. because yeah, yeah, especially for the secondary glaucoma cases. Yeah, I mean, look, you're gonna have to put a slit in, and like I said, I just prefer to have one thing I have to worry about, and that's the size of the slit. Mm -hmm. And even I get that wrong sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Anthony. I think that's all. Everybody, I, I have um read all the questions from the participants and it's already 12 past 20 uh, it, so we should end our discussion uh, could we have a take a taking photo dr mita uh yeah i can do that yeah and um, maybe yes. put mm -hmm. out the spotlight yeah yeah and i hope the participant can open their videos Okay. Um, okay, and I'll start taking the photo. Uh, one, two, three. Yeah, I think that's all. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Anthony, for your you. sharing. It is very nice to have your talk here. Uh, hopefully someday you could do again uh, yeah, uh, this online lecture with us. Sure, no problem. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, you. We are very thankful for your presentation and also Dr. Yuri, thank you for the presentation and I will end uh, this session. Thank you very much. Uh, good night, everybody. Hope you have a nice day for today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.